Statewide broadcasts of Your Legislators are made possible by the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by MAPES members who make sure Minnesotans have clean air and water, safe communities, quality education, and excellent veterans' care. We work hard for Minnesota. Live from St. Paul, we welcome you to another session of Your Legislators, a roundtable discussion featuring state lawmakers answering your questions and discussing important issues affecting the citizens of Minnesota. Join the conversation online on Twitter and Facebook. Now here's your moderator for tonight's program, Barry Anderson. Good evening and welcome to this week's version of Your Legislators. We're delighted that you have joined us on this spring day and we're going to have many things to talk about, the coronavirus and many other issues. I want to remind you that this is your program and invite you to call in with your questions or send them to us via the various electronic means which will appear on the bottom of your television screen. And we'll see that they get to our distinguished panel of guests. We begin this evening as we do each week by introducing that panel and as we have been doing in this era of social distancing and an attempt to uh, um, stay at least six feet apart from everybody, we've reduced our panel from four to two and we have two distinguished members of the Senate with us tonight. Last week was the House, this week it's the Senate uh, and we'll see, how this, uh, we'll see how this goes. We'll see if they have any opinions on what the House is doing. But, We'll leave that aside for the moment. Let's begin by introducing our guests this evening. I start with um, uh, Senator uh, uh, John Hoffman from District 36 in Champlain. Senator Hoffman has been with us a number of times this year. I think we're going to make him the host and he can ask me questions. <laughs> I love you. it. That's yeah, great. no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> uh, tell, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, Senator Hoffman, even though they've probably heard the spiel before. So. Th thanks, Judge. I, you know, it's great to be back. And absolutely, this is so refreshing to come and, and chat with you and, and, and talk to folks about what's happening around Minnesota. I, I live in Champlin. I represent Senate District 36, which is uh, portions of Brooklyn Park, all of Champlin, and a little bit of Coon Rapids. So one of my uh, foot is in Anoka County, the other one's in Hennepin County. So mm -hmm. It's always good to be here, and thank you for letting me come back. Delighted to have you. Uh, also joining us tonight, a uh, frequent guest on our program going back many years, uh, and candidly, um, I have to say that Senator Mary Kiffmeyer, who's joining us this evening, uh, uh, I've had the privilege of knowing her uh, back before she was even an elected official, and we're and talking... And before you were judged. And before I was, too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's exactly right. Three, well, uh, in fact, I, I maybe have told this story before, but I'll tell it here. Um, Many, many years ago when Senator Kiffmeyer was uh, uh, a, a, um, a Republican Party official in the Big Lake area. Mm -hmm. uh, Sherburn County. Yeah. Uh, Sherburn County. I had the privilege of uh, chairing some endorsing conventions up her way and uh, serving as parliamentarian and doing those kinds of things, which may say something about my social life, that I find <laughs> these things interesting, but that's, that's in fact what I was doing 35 or years ago or so. But anyway, Senator Kiffmeyer, we're delighted that you've uh, joined us here. President Pro Tem of the Senate, representing District 30 of Big Lake. Tell our viewers a little bit about your background. Well, I certainly appreciate being back again, Barry, mm -hmm. um, and certainly the reason why I had you, because you were fair and you were honest, <laughs> you knew the rules, and you had some good jokes, too. Well, you, you got to warm the crowd up, you know. Yeah, you did. <laughs> it was great. I really loved it. So I live in Big Lake, and the cities that I represent are Big Lake, Elk River, Otsego, Albertville, St. Michael, Hanover, and 14 homes in Dayton. Mm -hmm. And I chair the State Government Policy and Finance and Elections Committee on Finance Committee, HHS. I'm a former registered nurse and uh, live out in the country, and I've done every farmer kind of job mm -hmm. there is to do. I've picked stones uh, out of the fields till I had no fingerprints. So I've had a wonderful, rich life, and I'm glad to serve the people of Minnesota. And I think we discussed last year that your, uh, um, uh, your uh, uh, husband, of course, spent some time in the legislature, too, as I yes, recall. Yes, he did. It was my first campaign I managed. <laughs> so there you go. Well, we're, uh, we're going to start with uh, the governor's announcement uh, uh, that he's going to be continuing the 
two week, um, or for at least two weeks, the moratorium is uh, the stay at home order as I understand it. And maybe we'll start with, uh, let's start with you, Senator Hoffman. Maybe you can just tell us generally what the governor said. We can have a little discussion about it and then we're gonna move on to some specific issues. Thank you. I, uh, I caught wind of it uh, this afternoon, like like the rest of us, in, in listening to the extension that that he wanted, and, and really talked about people understanding what this social distancing is. And, and he, I, I will say, I was pleasantly surprised to have him talk about, you know, that pathway to getting some small businesses open again. I know Senator Kiffmeyer is. Uh, we were talking about curbside for some of the mm -hmm. cosmetologists and I mean we were trying to think outside the box and it was nice to hear him really kind of talk about all right how are we going to do this but really spend the time talking about you know how important this social distancing is um, you know we're, we still don't know this virus doesn't know I mean it, this virus needs to be taken under control and and so I think he's being optimistic and cautious at the same time and so um, We'll see what data comes in the next couple of weeks, and I'm sure that's always going to be something we'll be talking about for the next two weeks as well. Don't you think, Senator Kiffmeyer? Senator much Kiffmeyer, so. your thoughts? Yes, I'm beginning to have PTSD. Every time I hear the word COVID, I just <laughs> kind of go. But Should mention to our viewers that you have a medical background. She does. So. <laughs> yes, Mr. So, you know, in my public health training, the rule always was you quarantine mm -hmm. uh, the sick and the vulnerable, but the rest of the people went out and did their work. Now, maybe it's because I grew up in a farming community, so I have a little more of a, of a sense of that. No question about it. Uh, this virus, and by the way, we get the flu vaccine. Many people do every year. We still get the flu. People still die from the flu. This is a new virus, uh, without question. There's concern about where it came from, how it was developed, mm -hmm. and so on. But the large majority of people get mild to no symptoms. And without question, though, when it hits somebody who is vulnerable and it hits them hard, it's, it's really, really sad. But the good thing now is the not only flattening of the curve doesn't mean you have less cases. It means you spread it out so that the hospitals can handle the volume. We've Accomplish that and certainly that's really good news for us here in Minnesota. We're just a really good kind of uh, kind of Minnesota is kind of a state that just kind of follows the rules and does that I'm not sure with this extension though that this is the right move I think the dial might be stuck on high and I think it's going to be a little bit too long uh, folks out there, especially in rural Minnesota where you have counties without a single case very few cases no deaths for them to be under the same restrictions as others who are living in more of a hot spot, that really is bothersome to them. And they kind of feel like they're being controlled and managed and losing some freedoms that they don't really necessarily see the value for. I mean, what is the risk and the danger? So I think the other thing for me, I worked my way through nursing school by taking care of patients in a nursing home. And those stages of your life, family means so much. And it just aches my heart when I see people who are in nursing homes without family to comfort them. As one of my constituents said who just lost her father, she feels that with this isolation uh, that he just gave up. But she said, we didn't even have time to talk with him, to say our goodbyes, to be with him. I think there's gotta be a way to be safe and also have some compassion on the families and the children and everything. I so value those times with my mom and dad as they passed away, and I can't imagine what this is like right now. The other thing is suicides are going up. The um, issues that are happening with um, abusive situations and other things. So it's not just COVID. I mean, you gotta look at the whole person uh, for their health right now. So I'm, I'm a bit concerned about this extension right now. And those those issues need to be addressed. I mean, there's there's some discussion, uh, you know, a few weeks ago when Senator Abler and I talked about there was some worse than flexibility in this piece, right? And it was mm -hmm. almost like the one size fits all. And I don't know if that was because of the the cautiousness of the fact that nobody knew what this virus was. But you know, Senator, when you talk about that that heart wrenching piece about you know not seeing grandpa and grandma and seeing somebody mm -hmm. at the last moment in their life and they felt alone. I mean, that's traumatic for families and 
I don't know how you get that back. I mean, that's always going to be with you. I mean, there's some healing that needs to be going on. And yes, the mental health piece on this really needs to be addressed on that. So, you know, thank you for bringing that up. You know, you and I were talking before we uh, started today a little bit about day programs, which yeah. are really important. It's an area that you've had some uh, work with, particularly with the developmentally disabled and the effect on, on those programs. Can you talk kind of generally about that? I know we discussed it briefly when Senator Abler was here. And, um, and then I'll get Senator Kiffmeyer's reaction. But let's start there. You know, I, I, we were, Senator Abel and I were on uh, Conor O'Meara's uh, podcast, and, and he's somebody that, um, you know, participates in some day programs. Plus, he has three other jobs. And mm -hmm. the fact that his three jobs that he has, he's not able to work at, and he's not able to go see his friends at the day program. And, and one of the things that he said was, that, you know, there's loneliness, I don't have some social interactions, and I have a lot of anxiety. And it's really hard to see that happening because there's some things with the day programs. For example, in Winstead and Hutchinson, the day programs there, they're $40,000 behind on, on their transportation because they don't have any money to be able to pay what their piece is. We need to step in and help these folks by giving them a, a, a life vest. And that's what I mean, we talked about it in Senate File 3694. We had some retainer money that we voted on to say, you help these organizations stay afloat because here's what's going to happen if we don't keep those systems afloat, what's going to happen is they're going to shut their doors and then folks with disabilities aren't going to have some place to go in the community, aren't going to have a, a day program to go to, aren't going to have that social network that's there. And that's kind of inconsistent with my current understanding of federal law, Judge. I mean, that's just not okay. And, and it's not okay on that aspect of it, but it's also not okay on the fact that I've now gotten this social piece that's, that's missing. So um, I really, really can feel those organizations out there and the people that are there. Well, I think there are so many areas of hurt. And I've always uh, think we look at things and say, if there's real value in return, you know, you've got to have that going on. And I think that's what people are concerned about right now. Uh, I know small business owners that say, with this extension right now, they're just done. And so you're going to have another wave. And there isn't enough money in the federal or the state treasury to make up for losses in the economy. You can't do that. There just isn't enough to do that. Staying afloat is, is one thing, but they, they just can't. The other thing is that I spoke with the governor's office today for about a half an hour. I said, quit picking around. Set standards. If they can meet the standards, let them do it. If a restaurant can meet standards, can have a way, just like we have, we mm -hmm. mitigated our circumstances right now. We did just fine. We're grown-ups and we can do this. Same thing with tennis, some of the other sports that we have. Our kids, um, they're really struggling right now with um, the situation. Although this afternoon our son said his two kids were out helping him and they were emptying garbage and doing stuff. So maybe there's going to be some good out of this whole thing as well. But that's my concern. I think set standards. Don't tighten it so far that I think you're going to put at risk civil unrest and people are just going to say, I'm just busting out of here. And that's what happens when you tamp it down too long. And that's what I see and I hear from my local police departments as well, that they're seeing that increasingly. And I think it needs to be. Now, the governor did leave some openings, some little mm -hmm. wiggle room. Yep. Uh, elective Crazy. surgeries mm -hmm. is another one. Yeah, I, I just think that dial is still stuck too far. But I think the, some of the elective surgeries, they aren't elective. These days, everything that is done with medicine is done. Mm -hmm. Prescription and other things. When they get to needing a surgery, they need it. This is not like uh, essential, unessential. People really rankle at that because to them, this job is essential. It's essential to their families living, the salons and the spas and the barbers and everybody else. So I think we shouldn't put judgments upon one person's business to another and set standards instead. You know, it's interesting on the, on the standard side, when you look at these programs that we, we originally started you know, talking about on the, especially the day programs, I don't know how um, folks are going to get beyond um, this next phase without getting some assistance from Centers for Medicaid Services. And there's two things. And I brought, I shared uh, at our committee hearing the, the waiver that, that uh, the Washington, state of Washington got. They got approval from CMS to be able to hold harmless these programs, these organizations that help people with disabilities, saying that they could flexibility already use that 
formula money that was there federally. And in, in, in our state, you know, we're talking about utilizing money that we've already forecasted. It's sitting in the formula. It's sitting out there. And it's like, you know, why are we having such a hard time and why aren't we seeing that priority for folks like that? I don't understand that one, Mary. Yeah, that but we're, just, yeah. you know, on that particular area, John, yeah. I think I, I really do uh, sympathize with that. I think on the other hand, like on the roads and bridge account, so far they're forecasting probably a loss of $400 million to the road and bridge fund. When well, you have your townships, small cities, yep. and everybody else. So the, you cannot replace the economic activity uh, with a government dollar bill because that comes from somebody else who paid taxes, who paid sales tax, especially the sales tax revenue hardly uh, really has hit very, very hard. So I'm just hoping that um, we can be a little bit um, more standard-based and like even restaurants, uh, some of the restaurants so they can turn their parking lots into open-air seating. We mm -hmm. got this great gift of this beautiful spring uh, coming up, 70s this weekend. You know, in Minnesota, boy, when that weather goes mm -hmm. over 50 degrees, 60 degrees, we are just ready to <laughs> get out of here. Let it go. <laughs> well, I will say, when I went out for my afternoon run, there were, um, everybody was doing the social distancing thing, but there were a lot of people out there. There's no doubt about that. Let's move on to some other questions. We have a viewer who wants to know, we're going to start with you on this one, Senator Kiffmeyer. Since 1984, Minnesota has a moratorium on the establishment of new hospital licenses, and an expansion of existing licensed beds. Does this process make sense, especially under the current circumstances? This is a, a Minnesota's version of the certificate of need requirements. Right. Mm -hmm. um, talk, about the, talk about that a little bit and whether or not that might be something that changes. Well, I don't, I'm not a strong believer anyway of mm -hmm. moratoriums. I'm more a one who believes in the market. Uh, let it go. And generally, prices will go down if you have more uh, opportunities, uh, more hospitals also, especially in rural Minnesota. Uh, having smaller hospitals to be closer to you I think is a good thing. Right now um, there's been a consolidation of the very, very large health systems, buying up small ones. Uh, just issues with that, but I think uh, allowing us, and right now, a matter of fact, what we ran into with, uh, with the COVID-19 situation is our tightness mm -hmm. on the hospital beds. Mm -hmm. It was so tight, there was very little room for capacity. And that's what I think the viewer is kind of getting mm -hmm. into. If we had no moratorium, would we have more beds, have more capacity? But I think we've also seen the ramp up uh, very quick. Uh, it was just amazing to me at the speed at which uh, they've been able uh, to meet the need. Actually, right now, it looks like we're having a surplus uh, in that regard. So I think they really have ramped up, but I think it would be better to have things more distributed. Also, in a situation like this, if it's more distributed, you can uh, take in patients safely without a bigger system, and then now you've got it all mixed in with COVID, and it's harder hmm. to keep that separation. And yet it's funny, there's still there's an inconsistency. There's some hospitals that are furloughing some of the nurses, and then mm -hmm. somebody are saying, we'll bring in some nurses from out state. And I just had a friend of mine who uh, was spent some time at Mercy Hospital in our mm -hmm. backyard, and uh, they, he, had, he had some pancreatitis stuff going on, and, and uh, had, uh, he was one of only two people that were on his floor. And so it's almost like there's this inconsistency on that, on that discussion on where, where is it going. So I don't know if, if, if that question really breaches where we're at, because here's the other thing that came out, too, with the, with the COVID. I know COVID, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> PTSD, yeah, that one, Mary. Um, the, the amount of people that are no longer needing hospitalization, you, st you see that number creeping up. So there's something going right with, with what we're doing. And yeah. I don't know what that is. Help I, me understand that. Yeah, I watch that a lot because the number of positive cases, well, when, if we would have had, they say it's increasing. Well, if we'd have had the tests available before, right. we mm -hmm. would have had more cases also. Right. So that doesn't mean as much to me. I look at the number of hospitalizations, but even there, people are hospitalized for the flu, too. But mm -hmm. the ICU use has yes. plateaued. Correct. Hospitalizations, uh, the gap between hospitalizations and ICU has spread. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a really good direction. Now let's see where that's going. But I think also they've come up with um, uh, treatments such as proning now, which you don't usually hear of intensive care. This is where instead of laying on your back, you're put on your side or your stomach. It's called proning. And for some reason, with COVID patients, 
This is something that helps. But it also goes to show how our, our medical system uh, looks to meet the need of the patients. And if they do better in this position or that, they are with them constantly. They share with each other, you know what? This patient does better if he's more on his side or more towards the stomach. And they are sharing with each other. One thing I've noticed has been the science being shared worldwide. Mm. You see uh, scientists connecting with each other all over and little snippets of RNA and the DNA that the virus is made up of is not a whole one, it's a piece of one. And those little snippets, and they <laughs> look into the genealogy of them all and start connecting the dots at rapid lightning speed. Same thing with uh, uh, trials. Matter of fact, Hennepin County was involved. You've heard of the mm -hmm. Redisivir, uh, mm -hmm. Remdesivir, I think, yep, drug. Right. Yep. Hennepin yep. County had some patients in that trial. And so they were part of that. Just a really, really phenomenal thing that's rapidly happening. And I think we, in our, what we are doing as far as economy, should respond more quickly to that and allow a lot, a lot more opening because those things are happening, that care is improving rapidly. So in response to the viewer's question, I think what we can say is it's probably unlikely that the legislature is going to take any action on uh, that moratorium, which goes back to 1984, between now and whenever the legislature goes home. Is that... Is that I, I, I mean, this think, year, no, not no. too likely. It's too early to um, go to that solution. So we have another viewer who's got a very important problem uh, <laughs> that we needs to be addressed. Should uh, microcraft breweries be allowed to sell 12 64 ounce containers in store for at home consumption. Now we're getting into the, you have to remember, <laughs> the last an, time. This is an important problem by golly. The last time the government was shut down, right? It was government though. The last time that happened, what stopped it was when they couldn't get the beer uh, tickets or seals or whatever they oh used. Oh my God, yeah, the, the, that's, the, this, yeah, the, the Minnesota That's what did it, Minnesotan said, enough already. The 2010, 2011, that, that shut yes, down? Yes, that was what did now it. Now I Everybody, know, Mary, I thought it, I thought it was the. Well, they <laughs> were. <laughs> Uh, legislative <laughs> principle, but if you mess with the breweries, you've got problems. Well, you, you notice problems. this time they kept the liquor stores open. <laughs> but the unfairness that people feel because the microbreweries, which is a great local market, I mean it is a dynamic local market, really fun, uh, very community driven, and they feel that they're put in the squeeze during this time. There's other kinds of folks that have had uh, emergency orders, lifting of different things, but for some reason, and by the way, the liquor stores making money hand over fist. They are just selling gangbusters. They're busy all the time, and yet these microbreweries, uh, they are dying on the vine. So some of them have converted to sanitizer. They've done community things. They've mm -hmm. given stuff away, but especially going to May 18th, uh, it's just, just unfair for them to be at an extreme disadvantage when they're selling many times a similar product just in a little different way. If you can go in the liquor store, why can't you go in the microbrewery, get your product, or do a curbside if you want to do mm -hmm. that. But if you can go in the liquor store, I don't see why you can't go somewhere else. And that's where the standards should be set rather than saying, oh, this one can mm -hmm. and this one can't. Instead, you know, if you did it in that standards base, but in the microbrewery, they don't have off sale. Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest problem for them. And so this would be just a temporary situation for them to have some off sale. And the, and the biggest concern on that, Judge, was the, the, the fact that there was a, a brewery right here in um, uh, Minneapolis that ended up, and 421, they actually poured all the, the brew that they had that oh, they were made. Wow. It was like down the drain <laughs> it went. And it's like, so now this is money that I put into this product, and now I'm having to pour it out. So the question came up. Um, last week and I think this week too is is there some uh, tax credit or something that you know we could give that that <laughs> popped up and I don't know Mary if that came in front of you uh, your committee at all but that's I know that was one of the questions that popped again, up John, yeah. there's just not enough money in the coffers yeah. to do all of that you so just is, can't. is something like this viewer is suggesting does that require legislative action or could the governor deal with that under either his emergency? One. Either one. Either right one. Right now, the way the executive order rolls out, the governor could could make a motion on that. But mm -hmm. going back to what Senator Giffmeyer just said, you know, when you only have X amount of dollars, and, and this came up too. You know, I heard one person say, "Well, you think the deficit was bad in 2010, 2011, 2012 that you and I inherited, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When we came in, no, we were there for it. We yeah. were there for that in 2012. I remember that 6.2 billion." Um, folks said, 
it's going to be bigger than that, right? But we did and do I it, John. Yeah. We did it thoughtfully. I remember you and Senator Abler and Health and Human Services Committee. I was yep. uh, there at the time as well. Um, the thoughtfulness at working it through and talking about it and working with the people that were there. We were very, very thoughtful. We did not raise taxes or fees because the last thing the people need or the economy needs is to take money out of the economy through taxes because then it's not there for people to buy what they need. And by the way, they have needs during yeah, how those do you find that balancing too. act, right? Well, the big yeah. thing is, I think, for government periodically, I remember other governors have said so, it's an opportunity to rethink. We've also instructed or talked to, I should say not instructed, we have mm -hmm. no authority there, have talked to... Uh, I think our only authority is to sure? convene, right? <laughs> ask questions. It's it. to ask oh, questions. Oh, I know. It's just to be <laughs> legislative questioning. But those are good. Uh, but to ask the, uh, in regards to state government, um, I talked to the Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget that works with all the employees statewide uh, through the state government and that you know this is going to be hit. The advantage you have now is time. And so uh, I, even the governor of Wisconsin, Democrat governor of Wisconsin, already said 5% pay cut. Uh, right now we have a bill in front of the legislature um, to, raise, to raise the pay. No, that's the bill that's in front of us right now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought yeah. there was a discussion And so the we've told the commissioner this is not yeah. the time to be doing that, and this is the time also to be rethinking about, you know, if you can do different ways of doing business so we can meet the needs of Minnesota people, but can we do it in a more efficient way? This is the time to restructure, rethink, and... We you know, had that conversation when I was on the school board. Anoka Hennepin at the time had 42,000 students and in a period of time all of a sudden dropped down to 36,000 students. I mean, it was the largest, still is the largest, but there was just all of a sudden, we were graduating people, people were there, and there was a need to right size. I remember Kathy mm -hmm. Tinglestead, who was once in the house with you, mm -hmm. She was uh, a school not board. with me, but was she before. With you? Before you. Mm -hmm. um, she was on the school board with me, and, and we always kept using the word, it's time to right size the school district. And, you know, and that was closing down, you know, eight school buildings and reconfiguring. And, and we just mm -hmm. kept saying it needs to right size because it made no sense to supervise empty classrooms. It made sense to right size. And so it's almost like where you're going with that is, you know, maybe the conversation is, how do you right size government again to, to deal well, with what we're doing here, right? I don't know. Things, I don't, yeah, but one know. of the things that's happening out of all of this is that we're learning new ways of doing things. And some of the folks have already been saying, when this time is over, some of these things in the counties and the cities as well, we need to continue some of these things that like we found ed. some ways to like do. Some it. of the stuff in higher ed. I, right. Yeah, it's interesting to be there. Barry's looking for another subject. So uh, we got a view from <laughs> Bemidji who wants to talk about a non. -co well, I think everything is related to the coronavirus, right? It's all. It's, it impacts everything that is being discussed today. Well, it's not muskies. Is, no, it's not muskies. <laughs> but this viewer from Bemidji wants to talk about what's the status of the Environmental Trust Fund LCCMR bills and will they pass this session? You know, I just heard that they had another hearing on it, that there was a conversation uh, yesterday, I think. Um, and I think it's they're trying to move forward with that. I know there's lots of, lots of debate. Like there is every year the LCCMR bill comes up. Somebody wants to do something different, and somebody yet wants to say, mm -hmm. no, let's stick with what the bill that was presented to us from the LCCMR. And I don't know where along the path that is. Well, the problem is that was developed before mm -hmm. B.C., before COVID. Right. So so if AC, hopefully, and then uh, MC, middle of COVID. So we are, I, I don't, are we at right now? I don't <laughs> know if some of those things need to be when you're in the middle. I call it some middler. That's the toughest time sometimes ever. Mm -hmm. But at any rate, I don't know if they're just uncertain right now. And also, we're so focused on COVID, it seems like dealing with that subject. But we got three weeks, and as you know, legislatively, Three weeks, especially towards the end, is still a lot of time. I know, and, and they were. I know there was a, just a hearing yesterday again on mm -hmm. it. I know the conversations have been going on. So, mm -hmm. Stay tuned. Stay, yeah, tuned. stay tuned. Right. Mm -hmm. So here's an issue that we have not discussed in any of the programs so far this, this year, and I don't know that in, we've discussed it previously, but a viewer from Appleton wants to know, what is the status of proposals that will allow the whole state to use rifles for deer hunting in 2020? Anybody know anything about that? Rifles? Rifles. Yeah. Well, we have shotguns, but rifles, usually that's a long distance 
you know. Are but they talking about a 30 at six? I mean, what's his? No, I, rifle. I, I have read rifle, you the rifle. question. <laughs> I, this oh. is all I know about it. <laughs> and you know what, John? If we don't know a whole lot, we might want to. I think we just say, I don't know the answer to that one. Do you know, Mary? <laughs> I just know rifles go long distance in yeah. most places in Minnesota. You know, Wyoming, Utah, some of those other places. But if you're going to shoot a deer or some of those no. uh, yeah. deer hunting, you need to be a little bit closer, so all, I don't all, know. All I will say about this topic is that my, my uh, father, who died when I was 11, was a, um, uh, did a lot of hunting and fishing. Uh, and my mom felt very strongly I should take a gun training class. And sure. I had the nicest World War II veteran who was working with me, teaching me. Uh, we were going through uh, you know, the clay pigeon thing and all of that. And at the conclusion of that, he suggested I find a different hobby. <laughs> So, so that that's my that. This is a question that I, I I've read it, but that's all you're going to get from me. And if, we're but, good. So we're good. We're good. What about students taking driver's training? How are they going to catch up? That's a Whoa. wow. Viewer from Macintosh wants to know that. I, you know, there's there maybe there's a, an opportunity to think outside the box on this one. You know, with now this visual, the the whole thing with being able to do virtual virtual driving. Uh, could possibly, I don't know. That's a huge public safety issue on that one. I, I don't well, know how to Well, it's also school. really rite of passage for the kids. I mean, oh. they live for the day that they can get their driver's license and be able to drive. So that's a really tough one. But I have to say, I, that is the first time that's actually come up in this conversation. I'm sure it won't be the last time. It has not been active in the legislative session. I do think that that's going to be a difficult one because of the proximity in a car. I remember we had at the time, we had these blocks. We used to practice before we got to get behind the car, you know, and this was when you could take mm -hmm. it in school. And we had, you yeah, know, we used to play with Yeah, I think they're just going to have some, have have some to. true yeah. on the road kind of thing. But, you know, the other thing, though, is uh, gloves, masks, you know, whatever you need to do, uh, help the kids, you know, think creatively about public safety and being protective, but there is time, especially in this particular group, uh, that one thing about this particular virus, as far as the kids, it is really usually, they rarely get it and rarely get it in a bad way. The bigger thing is the drivers, uh, t the drivers that are teaching or taking the testers, you know, to be sure that they are safe as well. But I think, you know, let's think a little more creatively instead of just yeah, no. Yeah, you're there with the driver thinking creatively is, you know, you don't know if I have that COVID virus on me, and even though it's not, might not affect me, I might be asymptomatic or I might not. I mean, and you can wear just, PPE. Right? There are things you can do. Absolutely. So we have a viewer from uh, the Lake Mille Lacs area who wants to know why isn't guided fishing allowed? I've been guiding for 50 plus years. Wow, that that see there, that's one of those a great point. It's yeah, like sir. why 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 did we ask the question on why can't a self service car wash be open, right? Mm -hmm. I mean there was one in Coon Rapids and now they can be, right? It's like that's another one where it's a guided fisher, uh, guiding fishing person that's, that's going to be right. And that's it's, what makes it really hard for people. They see those kind of common sense things and just really really struggle with. I it. think that would be one that we should. That's a great question. The next time you have a, a conversation, I mm -hmm. think you'd be. Asked that question. I mean, it's just like the one, Why? for example, I have a family in Brooklyn Park. Um, they own five uh, cigar and CBD oil. They own these, mm -hmm. play and one of them they own in Elk River. It's right in, in Senator Kiffmeyer's district. And they can't be open, yet there's so many other things that they sell at this exactly. place. And, and, and it's one person in this shop, Mary, that's yeah. right there in Elk River. Sole proprietor. Sole proprietor. Ought to, without question. Right? And if you yeah. use that distance, I'm not going to be in, you no. know, doing that, right? No. So those kinds of things, it would be nice to see more dialogue on that. And you know. So I've got another one that's along those lines, but, but, but we're going to hold that in abeyance and instead ask this question from a viewer in Crow Wing County wants to know about, uh, from our guests, about wastewater treatment issues um, mm -hmm. and w funding sources for wastewater treatment and things of that source. Dang. That's usually in the bonding bill, yeah. mm -hmm. and we're always in a very bipartisan way supportive of wastewater treatment and funding that, though I do hope the MPCA would back off on some of their standards. Right now, local governments are going to be really hurting for revenue. That's going to be really, really tough for them as well. They're going to feel it uh, in this situation, and if um, MPCA could just back things off a couple years, <clears throat> give people a little bit of room, it would really, really be helpful, but in the same time, in the meantime, funding wastewater treatment, those kinds of things, clean water, 
uh, wow. keeping making progress on it. Sounds like you'd want a higher bonding bill, right, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> Wastewater treatment and roads and bridges. I'm good to go. All right, then we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Highway 10's got to be included in that, right? We got to fix Highway 10, don't we? Highway 10? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, just yeah. John and I, Senator Hoffman and I worked together on Highway 10 transportation issues, but I know I always would tell them um, we need to get 169 that goes through Elk River, goes north through Elk River. Mm -hmm. Well, we did. Yeah. I mean, it was a phenomenal year season for me to get both Interstate 94, St. Michael Albertville, mm -hmm. and 194 going north uh, through Elk River. But I always said, if, if you go faster through Anoka, you're going to hit Elk River and come to a screeching halt anyway. So, <laughs> and, and you have, a, and there's a there's a safety so get there's my a road safety first. walkway. You remember it, you and I were on the bill to get safety for the for the pedestrian crossing yep. on that. Do you remember that? That was. And yeah. by the way, we got it. Yeah, we the did. The community, I encouraged them. I said, don't be afraid of those MnDOT folks. They are very very <laughs> nice people, and politely and respectfully tell them why this really matters to you, and show up at. And I want to tell you, did they ever? from four in the afternoon to eight in the evening, it was packed. And actually the MnDOT uh, folks from District 3 were happy about it. They mm -hmm. said, we want to hear from people and sometimes they're a little bit reticent about that, but um, they spoke up and we did keep the overpass, very important. That was cool. You, you know, the, uh, when you mentioned 169, <laughs> this has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to be asking, <laughs> but I'm gonna tell the story anyway. When, so uh, uh, after I left, Fairmont and moved a brief period of time in St. Louis Park. We had some clients up in the uh, Princeton and Malacca area, and so I was going to go um, on a nice May day, going to drive up mm -hmm. to see these folks, and it had not occurred to me, this is pre-improvement of 169, it, it had not occurred to me <laughs> that this was the opening of the fishing oh, season. no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I no. am on one. It is the no. worst traffic jam I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm in. I'm in the in a very nice bucolic rural area, going absolutely nowhere. <laughs> That's that was for me for years when I would go to Champlin to try to get over to Coon Rapids or Anoka to go to a school board meeting or just to go, you know, 5.6 miles. It would sometimes take me 40 minutes because of the fact that that would all 169 I, I, dumps onto 10 and 10 would be just like. Stop. I'd rather right. I'd rather try to exit the old Twins uh, Stadium parking lot <laughs> at the old Men's Bloomington. Stadium in Bloomington. <laughs> that was less painful. Well, anyway, enough enough. Help worse. is coming. Just so you know, it's, right. don't, I don't want to give Elk River too bad a rap here. It's it's going to be very nice and very good exits. Great restaurants. Great places. I used to, to stop. stop in Elk River uh, yeah. when, on my way up to have uh, breakfast there. So yeah, great so I, I I endorse that. Okay. So we have a viewer. Um, this is another one of those uh, stories that uh, that. Um, and I think the viewer's question is, uh, uh, is uh, certainly valid. This viewer owns a bowling business, 34-lane yeah. bowling alley with restaurant and bar. They're able to social distance better than most entertainment, but still can't open. Mm -hmm. um, this was our best business month of the year that's gone. What yep. do we do now? 33 weeks of bowling, right? I mean, that's what mm -hmm. the Bowling Proprietors Association has, and, and this is where, you know, you're, this is what people do. And, I know there's a House member, Brian Johnson, who owns a bull and alley in, in uh, central Minnesota. And, and, you know, that is a real issue. And, you know, again, you're sitting in chairs like this. You go up and you throw your ball and you come back. If, if we had some guidance standards or guidelines that Those, would be doing that. But I think they're that's... already well out there. The CDC, everybody. Yep. Matter of fact, I think even 10-year-olds could recite them right now. <laughs> so, I mean, it is well understood out there in that physical distancing. And don't I we as Minnesotans like to follow the rules, Mary? I mean, isn't that, or <laughs> Senator, I'm sorry, but that, isn't that something we do well? We we do the yes. social distancing. So let us, now. Let us uh, have a little room I like, there. I like where that's so going. We have a viewer who wants to know, what does the panel think about the size of the bonding bill this year? Anybody have an opinion on what the bonding <laughs> bill is going to look like? Senator Kiffmeyer, what do you think? Well, I think prior, again, BC, we were thinking more in the 775,000 range. Uh, that may go up some. It's, it's a negotiations. Uh, Senator Senjum is uh, very uh, good at managing this particular thing. I was on the bonding committee for four years. I cannot tell you what a privilege it is to travel all throughout Minnesota. I've been a half mile under in the mine shaft oh, up sure. in northern Minnesota. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I've been under a dam fearing mm. the rumbling of the water mm. and the thrumming on the walls that you just feel the power 
of that going through and yet you're being there. I've been way up in, uh, by Stillwater with the new bridge where you go up inside. I mean, the privilege you You've have. You've been on the new dam in Champlin, the Mill Pond Dam. That was a bummer. That's another project. one. That but the good. biggest <laughs> thing that I, I think always touched me more than anything was the small city where the mayor climbed down to take care of the pipes to keep them going. And so you see all kinds of tremendous things going on all across Minnesota. But wastewater, water treatment, those kinds of things, roads and bridges, we got to do the real nuts and bolts right now. And also it is a really good time uh, for jobs, you know, that, that kind of mm -hmm. help kind of a situation. So we'll see what happens. Meantime, road construction, they just put out a billion dollars in road construction this year. Uh, states all around the country I have really uh, expedited their whole process and they're doing road construction earlier than usual this year. Sonic. They hope that by mm -hmm. the time we get to AC that um, they can have a lot of the I, I road construction. I love the new, the new acronyms that our, our, our good <laughs> nurse is giving us. I, you know, the, the it was interesting that the, the whole bonding process when I was first elected, I remember the old dam in Champlin. They used to go down and they would, to, to lower the water table in the mill pond, they would have to physically go down and hand pull out these two by 12 wood, wooden planks. And now we, you know, through the bonding process, we're able to get that dam, clean up the safer. mill pond. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, it, it's amazing. But it's, it, it's kind of interesting how, when you look at um, where the governor's uh, bonding dollar amount is, where the house is, and, and I don't know have, have you and the bonding committee had a conversation about where do you think that dollar is, or is that still something? What, what's your thought? Because I know our bond rating right now is probably Senator the last Hoffman, year for us. Thank to you be. for asking that question, but <laughs> I think you know. <laughs> this is we leave these kinds of negotiations to uh, to the folks that have the duty and responsibility. So I won't get in between all that. So you're not in bonding anymore, is no. it, are you? No. Okay, I thought you were. I'm sorry, Mary. Because no. I know that uh, our bond rating right now, it, you very know, to, to borrow, it's very high, and our borrowing interest rate is like rates are one, very low. One percent, one point one, somewhere mm. in there. It's just mm. absolutely low, yeah. Judge. Yeah. So, so we have about what three weeks left before mm -hmm. uh, departure date. What, what we we've, we've talked about the bonding mm. bill. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about um, the the practice and how the legislature is going to be in session over these three weeks and what are the other issues uh, high priority issues that need to be dealt with in the course of that three weeks let's start with you senator Kipper. well one that i'm working on very strongly right now and by the way um, as we've gone through our new way of operating is working hard to have bipartisanship and also by camera between the house and the senate to work things out, work issues out. So my advanced practice, registered nurse bill, physician assistant bill, athletic trainer bill, an x-ray uh, um, technical kind of a bill. A variety of those ones are being worked on in a very, um, I would say in a very good way as far as trying to find common ground and agreement. But one of those that I'm working on that I carry particular responsibility for is the election bill. And so that again is coming along uh, real well. We have some money from the CARES Act uh, that is designed specifically to help in regards to the increased expenses in elections. So extra staff, cleaning supplies, uh, maybe plexiglass screens, you know, adaptations you need to go through. And the good news is that Minnesota's current election law allows for and encourages uh, the use of absentee ballots, which is, again, through the mail, or you can vote an absentee ballot in person at your right. county or city mm -hmm. office. That is already in place without an excuse needed. Right. So that is already right there for us to be able to use that 45 days. And you can apply for both the uh, primary in August and the general election on That's one true. application. And you can do that now. You can send in your application right now and request to have that ballot sent to you through the absentee ballot mail process. Or you can 45 days before, and remember we have 45 days, almost six weeks or more, to be able to spread out the in-person voting and doing that. But also I saw in Wisconsin 135,000 or so ballots were found in a post office bin, undelivered, uncounted. And so putting all our eggs in one basket of just using a mail process, there were concerns about the loss of revenue to the post office. They were concerned that they won't oh, be able no. to survive mm 
that they're going to have severe restrictions. And then you have kind of a nationwide kind of approach like this. So I don't think doing everything in that way is going to work. The other thing in public health is all of our many polling places that we have is actually a good way to do it. Smaller polling places where now you have a mixture of already people using absentee voting either in person or through the mail. And then on election day, using those polling places all throughout. Nothing better than a township or a city ward or a precinct where you have people. So I think that is a protection to us to have those polling places. The one thing is we need some adjustments. And one of those is not having polling places in nursing homes, assisted living, or congregate care. We need to, and we have a state law right now that says you have to choose your polling places by December 31st of the year before, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then they stay the same for the whole year, which is good policy. But during this time, we need to have a one-time uh, change that to needs allow to them change, right. to do that. Does that have I'll to go through your committee? Because the BC uh, piece, now you're in the MC, so on the AC. <laughs> we're in the MC <laughs> <I'm> stage, <laughs> so good, right? we're working hard on it. Yeah, but yeah. remember, I think it's likely that the August uh, primary and the general election November is going to be more in the BC. Remember, you always, even if you get the flu vaccine, people still get the flu and die from the flu. So this is a COVID type flu, it's a virus type thing. And it's got some unique characteristics about it, but it's going to generally, a matter of fact, I'm concerned about everybody being so cooped up that by the time they do come out, we can have a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. And so we don't want to have that. We really want to have that UV light May, June and July, and UV light kills bacteria, kills viruses in particular. Viruses do not like it humid and they don't like it warm or hot. So this is the time where, you know, get out there and be able to have some benefit from that. But the polling places with schools as well are kind of an issue. And I'm not really for having large gymnasiums where you funnel everybody in mm -hmm. and you go through that. That's yeah. a concern for me. I think it's better to have our distributed polling places that we have right now. I think that's a better public health way to go. But I think out of schools, so you aren't mixing the generations, right? Mm -hmm. That I think would be a good thing to do. Um, we have churches everywhere in the state of Minnesota that usually don't have anything going on Monday and Tuesday. So I think there are places uh, that we can uh, have polling places. And I absolutely think that our county election administrators, county auditors usually, and our city clerks and township clerks, they care about their neighbors. They're gonna do things. The big thing is to use the CARES Act money and to use the Help America Vote Act money to make sure that we do that. And one of the things that we've talked about is having the Secretary of State office, like um, I did, we did a state contract for election equipment. Well, who would have thought of it? Now we could maybe have a state contract for sanitizers, for plexiglass, for things that the counties would need. And instead of going out and bidding and having a contract, maybe a state contract. But we need options, because sometimes you have somebody who says, hey, I'll donate the plexiglass. I got time on my hands, I'll build a little stand. I saw them already in gas stations. So uh, there are creative ways, Minnesota's innovations. We just want to make sure that any laws that might endanger or hinder, uh, give flexibility where it's necessary. Uh, but already, Minnesota's current law I love it when she puts her nurse hat on. This is great. <laughs> you just you got the My public nurse hat. Your, your public health aspect and you you the little hint of public health that comes out. It's like, all right, this is uh, you know, you're learning something. My first four years in the Senate and I got in in and I was on the elections. That was one of the funnest committees to be on because you know, looking at Minnesota has this rich history, and it goes back, Mary, you were Secretary of State. I still have a piece of paper that has your signature on it as Secretary of State. It was like, um, and it is, it's on my office wall there. And um, I think I've told you that many times. But and, and so having the discussion about our, our voter integrity and how we do voting in Minnesota and how it's such a prideful thing that we do not take for granted and we do the right things in Minnesota and hearing about this nice choice of mix and options that we have in Minnesota and how you keep that with now that we're MC, you know, how do we assure that people are safe and hearing you talk about, you know, the small precincts and wards and I even think about where I vote now, I, you know, the Champlin uh, hockey arena and, you know, uh, there's a lot of folks that, you know, utilize that uh, 
the absentee balloting, no excuse voting that we have in Minnesota. They vote early. They vote um, to go through. Um, there's kind of already a built-in social distancing piece there. And, and so, you know, the, the, I guess the, the thing for you guys to do in the election is how do you make that a standard? How do you make that something? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, that's, a, I think. Well, but it's the same principle yeah. that I talked about. One size does not fit all. So we have rural Minnesota, we have inner city, but each one of those has a responsible authority. If we give them the, the basic tools that they need, let them have the standards and then let them have the flexibility to meet the needs of the folks they have. And by the way, I wanna do a shout out though for polling places. Uh, there's a reason for them. Uh, they were really specifically designed for privacy of your vote, to make sure that there was no coercion in the in the act of casting your ballot, that you had that privacy and that you had that buffer around you uh, so that you could vote in that situation. And there are um, other things that I think with the process of voting in a polling place, election day, you have the maximum amount of information. We found in the most recent presidential primary, there were people all of a sudden, can't two candidates withdrew they had already cast their ballot earlier, right, right, and right. now they couldn't Wanted do to. anything about it, right. and they were stuck with the ballot cast for somebody that at that time really wasn't even on the ballot. So um, getting all that information, doing that, but there's got to be a flexible way. The big thing is to avoid chaos, that we have things established in a bipartisan, in, in a way that we've all worked together on that. Once having done that, we should function within that. And I, think I remember Governor Dayton saying to us when we were on the same committee, he, mm -hmm. and he said, the only way election bill has to be a bipartisan mm -hmm. agreement. And I, there was a, always a joke when Scott Newman was on there, he used to say, you know, we used to say, what would Newman do, right? It would be like, <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> but I'm glad she brought that up. So Senator Hoffman, I want to come back. I've got another election question here, but before I do that, Senator Hoffman, I want to come back to you and ask you what, what priorities do you see the dealing with in the remaining three weeks? Um, in, uh, I'm thinking independent of coronavirus, but maybe that's part of the conversation too. You know, there's, I, I always have a deep, a deep um, passion to make sure that we're doing what's right for people that need our services, right? Mm -hmm. People with disabilities and our elderly. And, and I'm always gonna be um, the person in the middle of the room assuring that mm -hmm. folks understand that. And um, I, I wanna make sure that you know, stuff that we had done, and I know there's a, you know, we could simply do like, one one is th there's an autism inclusion uh, bill that we could probably do because we set aside some rules which would take really nothing hard to do. And I know it's sitting in your committee. Uh, Mark Coran and I are on it. I think you're on it too. It's a, I'll give you the Senate file number, 3652 that, or something. That's one of the biggest things that concerns me right now is we're so focused on COVID sometimes yeah. that some very important bills that's like that. And then the other one is like there's discrimination going on right now mm -hmm. with um, uh, organ transplants. There's there mm -hmm. absolutely, there's a discrimination about people with disabilities not getting organ transplants because they have a disability. That's just absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. And I know, uh, you know, that's, so stuff like that is really, really important to me, I want to see go through. I know that one's sitting in Senator Warren Limmer's committee, and clearly the, the provisions that, that we had worked in our committee on, making sure that you know our programs and providers and home and community-based services and people are doing, we wanted to do imagine, imagine independence. And I think you know at the beginning of the year, we talked with you about mm -hmm. that, and it was about for people that really want to have a job and have that career, let's make break down these barriers, stop these barriers from happening, and yet making sure that people that are saying, you know, well, I, I need these services, don't, don't, don't erode those. And so I'm always going to be there. I'm going to keep fighting for that, and that's what I, I want to keep doing, the stuff that we started at the beginning of the year in our Health and Human Services Reform yeah, Committee. Yeah, like some to of those. See. Absolutely. Yeah, right. Some of those things, Mary, go on. I have... Lots of bonding projects that are absolutely bipartisan. I think 90% of my bills are bipartisan, and I want to see Highway 10 get fixed. I know we talked, now 14's been fixed, 169's taking care. <laughs> Mary, you drive on Highway 10, and you always say, you got to get through Coon Rapids, let's fix that thing. Things like that. Champlin, there's still some pro uh, promises along there. It'd be nice to have those conversations to get that thing done, Barry. I absolutely would, would love to see that happen. I'll work with you, John. Thank with you, you Senator. So, so, so we have a so we have a viewer from St. Paul Park who wants to know: Should we do away with the closed primary system? 
how a person votes in a primary is not kept private, shouldn't that be changed? Now, I think this applies only to the presidential election, yeah. uh, if I recall correctly. Um, and, um, of course, we won't have another presidential primary for four years, or three, yeah, four years, three and a half, whatever. Anyway, the point is, um, this viewer is concerned about that issue. We've had some discussion. Anything happening on that, yeah. Senator? She served her yeah. committee, data privacy. Yeah. That's also one of your bailiwicks, mm -hmm. right? Well, what do you it do is, with that, but right? We're in the middle of something very uh, new to us in mm -hmm. Minnesota. And so I've told everyone I don't like to um, change things in the middle. Mm -hmm of the process is just kind of a fundamental thing, but I am absolutely open. Mm -hmm. uh, when we get through this next year, mm -hmm. uh, study it. I know that the University of Minnesota, other schools as well are taking a look at studying this, how did it work? But in the meantime, look at that. And just so people don't get confused though, the August primary, uh, that is one that is in what's called an, it's actually a modified open primary. Uh, if you vote on the Democrat side, mm -hmm. then you need all to vote only in the Democrat Correct. side. If you vote Republican, only in mm -hmm. that. So now if you get to nonpartisan ones, you can do Republican plus nonpartisan Democrat plus nonpartisan primaries. But you have that mix, and so I don't want people... But the point people... is there's no, there's no recording no. of your vote. It's a function you take your... You, you right. cast no. your ballot, and as long no. as you don't cross the lines and spoil the ballot, the ballot counts. And the nice thing yeah. is with the precinct optical scan, it checks your ballot before you leave because you have that privacy thing going on, which is wonderful. But if you do make that mistake, it'll tell you you can correct it and cast a ballot. Fifteen seconds left, Senator Hoffman. Any thoughts on the closed primary and election bills? Any you know, I, I absolutely. There was a it was a trial and error for us at the beginning. I know we had there was a conversation of a bill coming forward. You know, we really uh, folks are looking at it. And uh, bottom line is, I think we got to do a better job of of making sure that we're not discriminating people that want to get to the polls and get to the polls. This is one way of doing it. We can do a better job. Very good. I want to thank our guests for this evening. I want to thank you, the viewers, for being with us. This program is really all about you, and we're delighted to come to you each week during the time that the legislature is in session, and we're going to be here every week that the legislature is in session until they go home, whenever that might be. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, and good night. There's much more about your legislators online at pioneer.org slash yourlegislators. Find out more about the history of the program, who has been a guest, and watch past episodes and discussions by topic. To continue the conversation, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Your Legislators is made possible in part by the generous financial support of the Minnesota Corn Growers Association. From developing best practices that help farmers better protect our natural resources to the latest innovations in corn-based plastics, Minnesota corn farmers are proud to invest in third-party research leading to a more sustainable future for our local communities. Additional support by MAPES members who make sure Minnesotans have clean air and water, safe communities, quality education, and excellent veterans care. We work hard for Minnesota.